Hi guys, it's the day you're finally been waiting for, the day we get to actually graph rational functions. Are you excited or what? Uh, so we're just going to start with a quick overview of all of the steps required to actually graph these things. And then I'm going to show you three examples in this video, okay? I've already set them up on GeoGebra to show you when they're finally complete. We're doing these three examples. Um, and then I'll make another video to show you three more examples, okay? The cool thing and the interesting thing about rational functions is that they all look really different. There's not just one shape that's either fatter or skinnier or moved around like we have in quadratics or, or um, you know, cubics or square root functions or even sinusoidal functions. They, they can have very distinct looks. So um, you, you really have to get your critical thinking hats on and really analyze these functions. So it's a real test of do you understand what you're doing because you can't really just memorize um, what they look like. You really have to go through the process of all of these calculations. So the first thing you're going to do to graph a rational function is to find all of the discontinuities. And you always check for all four types. You just go through the thinking of is there a vertical asymptote? Is there a hole? Is there an oblique asymptote? Is there a horizontal asymptote? Okay, there will only ever be three of these because you can't have an oblique and a horizontal asymptote, but it's important to go through the thought process for all four just to make sure you haven't missed anything. Okay, once you know the discontinuities, you can tell me what the domain is, okay, and I'm expecting that in every graph that you identify the domain. Basically, you're just excluding any vertical asymptotes or holes. So anything, any x values that would make the denominator zero have to be excluded from the domain. Uh, next up, you find the intercepts. Okay, so just quick refresher on what the intercepts are. Um, to find the y-intercept, you just let x equal zero. So in other words, you're just finding f at zero. Okay, uh, it's always helpful to have a y-intercept. Then to find the x-intercept, you let y be equal to 0. So that means if your function is p at x over q at x, and you let that be 0, really it doesn't matter what the denominator is. Because uh, if you cross multiply, this q at x would just cancel out. So really all you're looking for is what values make p at x equal to 0. So, um, because anything that makes the denominator zero is a vertical asymptote or a hole, but any numbers that make the numerator zero are actually the x-intercepts. So therefore, the zeros of the whole rational function, so the zeros of f at x, are really just the zeros of p at x, where p at x is the numerator. So that's not too bad either. All right. Then we need to find where the rational function is positive or negative. So where it's above the x-axis and where it's below the x-axis. Now, there's only two ways for a function to pass through the x-axis. So in other words, there's only two ways for a function to go positive to negative or negative to positive. It either has to pass through an x-intercept or it has to be on either side of a vertical asymptote. So you need to set up all the values where you know there are zeros and x-intercepts and look in these in between these numbers to see whether the function is positive or negative, okay? Because it is only in between these numbers, so the zeros and the vertical asymptotes, where a function can switch from being negative to being positive or vice versa. Okay, so hopefully that becomes a bit more clear with the examples, how to do that. Uh, then you determine the behavior on either side of the asymptotes. Often, to be honest, that's not actually necessary because um, you know if something's positive, then it has to be approaching positive infinity next to a vertical asymptote instead of negative infinity. Um, but we'll get, I'll show you how to do that in the examples. And then once all of that's done, if you're still just not sure like how steeply does this graph curve when it's going from asymptote to asymptote or like um, how high does it go or whatever, then you can just like throw in values of x and see what the y coordinate is so that you just have a few ordered pairs just to make sure that you're doing everything, everything right. Okay, just to make sure that the shape is as um, 
as nice as it can be. And so that really shows me your critical thinking that you're thinking about uh, putting in this x value is, would be really useful to me in determining a good shape of this rational function. So in this note, we're doing these three examples. Okay, the first three on your note. And so you're going to need graph paper, okay? You'll probably end up wanting to use an entire uh, piece of graph paper for each question. So I've set up a, a table, a, sorry, my axis here, but I'm gonna be doing the analysis below and kind of flipping back up um, as I can. So this first function is f at x equals two divided by x minus three. Now, this is actually just a reciprocal function that's been stretched by two, multiplied by two. So really, um, all of our knowledge of reciprocal functions will come back into play here. Okay, but the first step, number one, is that we check for all discontinuities. So we can tell that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals three. Okay, we know it's at three because it makes the denominator zero, but it doesn't make the numerator zero. Okay, for graphing purposes, you don't have to tell me why you know this is true. You just have to identify it properly. Okay, and you also don't need to say there's no holes, whatever, but um, if it helps you to set up like all four discontinuities each time, just to remind yourself to check for them, you can, but I don't need you to tell me there's no holes, but there aren't any. Okay, now there is a horizontal asymptote. This is a bottom heavy function, okay? The degree on the bottom is one, the degree on the top is zero, so it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Uh, so there's no oblique asymptote because it's not top heavy. So I'm gonna go ahead and graph those. So you want, oops, you wanna use a ruler all the time when doing your asymptotes, okay? It's gonna make things a lot better. So I'm gonna get a straight line here. So I'm gonna do, you should do a dotted line. So here, I'll do this green dotted line, see how it looks. At x equals three. And then we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, and then you wanna label them with the equation. So this is y equals zero. And down here, this is x equals three. All right, so we know that the function is gonna exist either here and here or here and here, but we have to do a bit more work to figure that out, okay? Or it could actually exist here and here or here and here, we don't know. So we gotta do some more work, but that kind of sets the stage for us. So that's step one. Step two is to find our um, domain. So we say x such that x cannot equal three. But other than that, x is in the set of all real numbers. There's our domain. Okay, step three is to find the x and the y intercepts. Oh my goodness, I, there's a fly. Okay, so f at zero, we just sub zero into the function. So that gives us two divided by zero minus three. So that's minus two thirds. So zero minus two thirds is the y-intercept, okay? And the x-intercept, there is none because that y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. And you'll notice that if I set this equal to zero, I wouldn't be able to solve that, no solutions. Okay, so now I can go up and label my y-intercept. It's right here. Okay, label it with the coordinate. All right. So now I wanna determine where things are positive and where they're negative, okay? So I'll show you how to set up these intervals. So I have to look at my zeros and my vertical asymptotes. So my zeros, so I can now look at zeros and VA. So notice there is no zero, so the only thing I'm looking at is X equals three. So I just have to text, test when X is less than three and when X is greater than three. Okay, now let me explain this to you. If the function is negative for any point below three, then the function has to be negative all the time before three, because there's no other place that it could ever cross up into the positive area, okay? Because there are no x-intercepts, so there's no way it could break through to the positive area. There's also no other vertical asymptotes over here, so there's no flip in positive or negative. So if there's any point less than three that's negative, then that means that the entire function is negative there. 
Okay, and I already know my y-intercept is negative. So therefore, f at x is negative when x is less than 3. Okay, so now I just have to check when x is greater than 3. So I put any point greater than 3 into the function. It doesn't matter. And I would get 2 over 1, which is greater than 0. So therefore, f at x is greater than 0 for all values greater than 3. Um, again, there's no possible way, if this is positive here at 4, 1, 4 2, which I might as well plot that point actually now that I found it. There's no possible way for anything else to go into the negative realm. So if it's positive there, it has to be positive everywhere. So I know my general shape is going to be like this and like this, but I'm just going to throw in a few more coordinates just to make sure that it's a bit more legit. So I'm going to throw in um, 2, okay? If I throw in 2, I get 2 over 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. So I get negative 2, okay? So now I feel like that gives me a pretty good shape to know how it's going to approach the asymptote. So I'm going to go ahead and say that's good enough. Okay, I need to make sure that I show that it's approaching the asymptotes. It's going through these, oops, sorry about that. It's going through this coordinate and then it's approaching this asymptote. Okay, getting closer and closer without touching. That's 2, negative 1. All right, and then up here, eh, I'm going to find another coordinate because I don't think this is enough. I'm going to throw 6 into the function. So if I put 6 into the function, I get 2 over uh, 6 minus 3 is 3, so 2 thirds. Okay, so that just gives me a better... Oh, man, doing this on a trackpad, you guys might be making fun of me right now, but it's not easy. Okay, if I put in 5, I would get 2 over 2, which is 1. So actually, 5, 1 is a good point to show there, too. Do, 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 do. You guys are laughing at me right now. I'll show you on paper and pencil some of these days. I can do a really good job, I promise. Okay, then you approach the asymptote. Okay, and you might as well label these points. And there you go. And so there is your function. All right, so you can label it f of x. Okay, so if you go to GeoGebra, um, you can see, you can check 2 over x minus 3. There it is. I have an y, an asymptote of y equals 0, x vertical asymptote of x equals 3, and it's in those two quadrants. Yay, I did it right. I feel good about myself. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, here we go. Okay, so now we're going to do... Uh, another one. We're going to, to graph the function f at x equals x minus 2 over 3x plus 4. Okay, so just kind of think about this function. Um, it's a linear over a linear, so the degrees are equal. Um, so this um, nothing's factorable. If you can factor, you should always factor first, um, but I can't. So actually, you might want to go back to your note and write that at the top of your note. Before you do anything, you should factor um, numerator and the denominator, okay? Because then you can see if anything crosses off or what the zeros are. So if it is factorable, that's actually the very first thing you should do. Okay, so step one is to find the discontinuities. Um, if I set my denominator equal to zero, I can find my vertical asymptote, which in this case is minus four thirds. It's a vertical asymptote and not a horizontal, sorry, not a whole because that doesn't make the numerator zero. Okay, I also have no, so no holes. I have a horizontal asymptote um, at y equals one over three, okay? The degrees are even, so it's the ratio of the leading coefficients, 1 to 3. And then no oblique asymptote because um, it's not top-heavy. So part 2, then, I need to give my domain x such that x cannot equal minus 4 thirds, but it can equal anything else, okay? I don't ask you to do the range in this case for graphing, just the domain. So now we need to find the intercepts. So f at 0 would give me 0 minus 2 over 0 plus 4, so I have minus a half. So 0 minus a half is my x-intercept. Okay, so 
Um, normally I would have graphed stuff by now, but I kind of forgot. So I'm just going to go through and do the x-intercept too. So to find the x-intercept, you can just set the numerator equal to zero. So x minus two equals zero. So therefore it's x equals two. So two zero is the only x-intercept. Okay, so let's go up here and graph this. Two zero is the x-intercept. Um, zero minus a half is the y-intercept. I'm not sure where I want to put that label yet, so I'm going to wait to label that point till the end. Um, and then I have a horizontal asymptote at positive a third. So that's about here, I'm going to say. And I have a vertical asymptote at minus four thirds, which is basically like minus one and a third. So that's here-ish. Okay, and then I want to label those with their equations. So y equals third, x equals minus four thirds. Okay, so now I need to remind myself um, that, what, what am I, sorry, what am I trying to say? Okay, so I need to check the positive and negative intervals. So I can kind of already see here it's going to be negative. So this is going to be approaching the asymptote negative because there's no other way for it to cross the x-axis. And I can assume these two connect. And then I'm kind of assuming that it's going to go up like this, but I don't actually know that for sure. It could hit two and then go back down. It can cross the one third. I don't know. I have to do more work to figure out what's going on past x equals two. So, and then I also need to figure out where it's happening before x equals minus four thirds. So our fourth step where we're determining positive and negative intervals, we have to be looking before negative four thirds. Okay, between minus four thirds and two, and then when it's greater than two. So I'm making these intervals based on any x values that are x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes. Okay, so before minus four thirds, I can just put any value uh, smaller than that in there. So I'm gonna put in like, I don't know, minus two. Okay, so that gives me uh, minus two minus two is minus four all over three times minus two is negative six, plus four is negative two. So this gives me positive two. So therefore, f at x is positive before minus four thirds, okay? Between these two, we already know that f at zero is negative a half. So we know that the function is negative in that area, okay? Actually, I'm gonna plot the point negative two, two, because I have it. Okay, and now I gotta check greater than two. So I'm just gonna put in F at three. So that would give me one over three uh, X of nine plus four, so one thirteenth. So that's positive. Now, huh, I'm confused because one thirteenth is less than a third, sure, but do I actually go through this horizontal asymptote and end up approaching it from above, or do I end up approaching it from below? So I'm going to see if this function will ever actually equal a third, so if I ever actually go through a third. So um, x minus 2 over 3x plus 4, does that ever equal one third is my question. Is there a point of intersection between those two lines? So if I cross multiply, I get 3x minus 6 equals 3x plus 4. Okay, right away I can see that there are no solutions here. So therefore that means it never actually crosses this asymptote. So I can confidently say that therefore it's going to approach it from below like this. Okay, now another way of figuring this out is saying where does... Um, the function approach its asymptote. Does it approach from below or above? So another thing I could do is put in like a thousand into this function, okay, and see what I get. So if I go to GeoGebra, where I already have it set up, I can just put in, see this is my g at x, so I can put in g 
Oops. No, I got a G at hello. I don't know why you're here. Get out of here. What? Is anyone else going on? Okay, this is just strange. Okay, I can put in G at a thousand. Okay, or I can just do it in my calculator. And now, of course, my computer's freezing. Awesome. Okay, and I will find that I will get a number slightly below one third. Okay, if I put in a thousand. Okay, I'll get 998 divided by um, 3004. And if you put this in your calculator, you'll see that this is just slightly below one third. So therefore, as X approaches infinity, Y is approaching one third from the negative side. Okay. Um, so then what's going on over here? This means too that the function is approaching its vertical asymptote this way because we know it's positive in this section. And we know that it also has to be approaching its horizontal asymptote this way because we know that it never crosses its horizontal asymptote. But it might help us to put in minus three or minus four just to help us give more shape here. So if I put in minus three in my function, I get minus three minus two over minus nine plus four. So minus five over five, so minus one. So that helps me plot that and just helps give it a bit more shape. Okay. And now you, now you know you can put minus 2, 2, minus 3, 1. And I'm going to go back here and label this because remember I wasn't quite sure where I wanted the labeling of this coordinate to go because I didn't want it to be in the way of my graph. And I can see too that maybe putting 2, 0 there wasn't a good decision. I put it should have put 2, 0 here or something like that. Okay, and there we go. There's our, our graph. So you can go to GeoGebra and actually graph it if it's going to cooperate and see that you did it right. So there it is. Um, horizontal asymptote of a third, vertical asymptote of minus four thirds, and it's in the proper quadrants. It's approaching it the correct way. All right, third and final one for this video. It's going to have a different shape than either of those two. Okay, um, you'll notice already I made my uh, scale a bit different because I know this is going to, I'm going to need a bigger scale for this. Uh, so we have uh, f at x equals x squared plus 4 divided by x plus 1. Now you might be tempted to uh, factor that. It's not a difference of squares, so notice that's addition there in the middle, so you can't factor that. Uh, so you, there's no factoring, so I just go ahead and look at my discontinuities. So right away I notice that I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1, not a hole. Um, and there's no hole and there's no horizontal asymptote because it's top heavy by one. So I have to look for an oblique asymptote. Okay. So I do my, my division x squared plus zero x. Don't forget that placeholder plus four divided by x plus one. So now we go and we do our division so x. Okay. I subtract and I get negative x. Plus four, bring that down. Do I do this example before? Because I think I did, because now look, it's x minus one again. Why do I keep having the oblique asymptote x minus one? That doesn't always happen. Okay, it actually doesn't matter what the remainder is here. It happens to be five. Um, but our oblique asymptote is that y, y equals x minus one. All right, so I'm gonna go up here and actually draw these. So I have my vertical asymptote at x equals 1, which is there, and my oblique asymptote at x minus 1. So it's going to be hard to do this on here. Um, basically, I have a point here, a point here. Oh boy, how am I going to do this? It's like this. Yeah, I'm just wondering if I can extend this part. Okay, I'm just going to put two lines together. That kind of looks ridiculous. Uh, there you go. Okay. There you go. So there you have it. So now I'm going to label those. Um, y equals x minus 1. And x equals minus 1. 
Okay, you should actually extend this down further. Again, it's just kind of hard in this method to do that. I'll kind of just draw another line there, but you should extend that down. Okay, so there's my discontinuities. So my domain is x such that x cannot equal negative one, but it's in the set of all real numbers. There's my domain. Okay, now I need to find my y, inter my y intercept. So f at zero is equal to zero plus four over zero plus one. So four, so zero, four is a coordinate I can plot. So again, I'm not gonna label this yet because I don't know where the best place for the label is. And I'm gonna let my numerator equal zero to find, so x squared plus four equals zero. So x squared equals minus four. So notice I can't solve this. So therefore that means there's no x-intercept. Okay. So if you look at this, that can make sense because uh, basically just never going to cross the x-axis. It's all going to be here and here is what's going to end up happening. Okay. So it never actually crosses the x-axis. Okay. So now we need to find where this function exists. So now we're on, sorry, part four. We have to look on either side of the vertical asymptote to see where the function is. So when it's less than negative one, let's throw in two. So f at two is equal to two squared plus four over two plus one. So four plus four is, so eight over three. So we get two, eight and eight thirds. Sorry, I'm trying to look at negative, less than negative one, my bad, let me change this. Minus two, so it's minus two squared which is still eight, and then minus two plus one. Okay, my bad, which is negative one. So it's equal to negative eight. So we have minus two minus eight as a coordinate. So therefore the function is negative on the left side of the asymptote. So negative two, negative eight is the point. Okay, so if, since the point is here and I'm not gonna cross my asymptotes, the whole function I know has to um, exist within this little area. All right. And I already know that my y intercept is here. So I've already know that it's positive here. What I don't, and I know that it's approaching this asymptote. So I, I can be pretty confident about this shape here because they're pretty close, right? So that's going up. This is coming down, approaching this asymptote. But what happens in this space? So this is where you got to think about how many points do I need to figure out what's actually going on here. So if you put a negative three into the function, you get negative 6.9. So negative three gives you negative 6.9. So it's just like right there-ish. And if you put negative four into the function, you get, sorry, negative 6.5. If you put minus three into the function, you get minus 6.5. And if you put minus four into the function, then you get minus 6.9. So that kind of gives you an idea of where this is going. It's going to kind of go up to here, down to here, and then it's going to go this way, but get closer and closer to this vertical asymptote. So there you go. And then you can label the key points. Okay. Um, and up here, what's going to happen? Well, if I put four into the function, um, I get 16 plus four. So 20 divided by five. So I get four. So four, four is a point. So what happens in between here? So if I put two into the function, I get eight thirds. So one and two thirds. So about here. Okay. So you can play around with this to see how it's going to look. Okay. To see how much information do you personally want in this area to feel good about how that shape looks. All right. If you go to GeoGebra, you can test, see what this looks like. Okay. There it is. You'll notice you'll have to zoom out be able to see it properly. So that's the general shape it makes, okay? So if you're not getting the right shape when you test it in GeoGebra, go back to your analysis and say, um, what else can I do that I didn't already do to get a more accurate shape, okay? So that's your first introduction into graphing these things. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you learned lots.